and uh, well, I will just directly, uh, you know, take you further along this journey that uh, that Ed started in in very much uh, detail before, and uh, I will focus on uh, uncovering the architecture of brain tissue with uh, light microscopy. So we are located at the Institute of Science and Technology Austria, uh, which, uh, well, for for every one of you uh, who is located in Vienna, may be known uh, as a place somewhere in the Viennese forest. Uh, actually, there is a very nice science happening there. And uh, one distinguishing feature is that uh, the Institute fosters approaches across disciplines. And when I take you on this little journey now, uh, we amalgamate elements from neuroscience, biology, physics, and computer science to develop technologies with which we can uh, extract previously inaccessible information from brain tissue. As Ed introduced uh, in, in great detail, light microscopy is very good at visualizing individual cells, like here, individual neurons, but already when you, um, here we go, already when you start zooming into these structures that collect the signals from other cells, the dendrites, you could uh, think of the antenna of the neurons, uh, then it starts being a bit blurry uh, for, the, for the spatial scales you want to be looking at. Each of these little dots here bears, uh, bears one synapse. And when we zoom in further uh, on the scale of individual synapses, uh, you see that the scale bar here is just a few hundred nanometers. Then it gets totally hopeless to decode the architecture uh, of uh, the molecular arrangements with conventional light microscopy. So one it can safely argue that there is a technology gap between electron microscopy on the one hand side, which has exquisite spatial resolution uh, and uh, even allows to reconstruct brain tissue in 3D in all its cellular constituents and how they're wired up. Uh, however, uh, electron microscopy is static and it's fairly hard to get access to molecular information. Uh, on the other side, there is light microscopy uh, which can be applied to living and fixed, uh, meaning preserved specimens alike. Uh, and it's very straightforward to get information on specific molecules and on the activity of, for example, brain cells. However, as uh, you can see here quite drastically, resolution is severely limited. So super resolution microscopy closes this gap uh, progressively uh, and uh, what you can see here, for example, is, uh, is a very similar synapse, actually recorded with the same microscope, and you start seeing the individual synaptic vesicles where the neurotransmitters are stored, and then in pink you see the region where they're released, and in yellow you see where they're detected by the next neuron. And the reason why I selected uh, specifically this image was because it was uh, performed with expansion microscopy. Here in, in this case, we expanded uh, the cells tenfold in each direction, meaning that there is a thousandfold uh, uh, volume uh, increase. But as Ed pointed out, the cells you need to be preserved, so uh, they are fixed. Uh, and in addition, only a sparse subset of the structures is visualized. So we were asking ourselves whether there is a way how we could reconstruct brain tissue in its living state, capturing its dynamics. Uh, and to do this in a 3D nanoscale resolved manner over time. Uh, and uh, when I place the term dense here, I mean that we want to visualize all the structures in the tissue and not just uh, a few structures. So if we uh, very briefly liken the brain uh, to such an electronic circuit, we can ask ourselves, well, what may we want to ex uh, extract from such a circuit. Obviously, we want to know how it's wired up, what the structure of the circuit is. But then, in addition, we want to know uh, what, uh, what the signaling activity is uh, and how the signaling activity relates to the structure. Uh, and, uh, well, where this analogy with the brain immediately breaks down is when we, when we think of what the brain actually does uh, when when we talk, when we speak, when we think, well, it constantly modifies its structure. Uh, it's a very dynamic uh, organ. Uh, and with live microscopy, we may be able to ask how these structures evolve over time and how the remodeling relates to activity. 
Well, this is not a totally trivial task because there's, uh, there is uh, challenges. We can't use expansion microscopy in this case uh, because we need to write uh, the increased resolution directly into the living uh, specimen. So we need an all optical approach uh, and it, uh, it needs to be compatible with the living specimen. However, as I told you before, the resolution is fairly limited in light microscopy and all the structures that fall into a volume that, that is a few hundred nanometers wide uh, and, and even you know, much longer, uh, they light up together uh, and they're just indistinguishable. So uh, that's not commensurate with the very fine grain structure of brain tissue. Uh, therefore, uh, we resorted to a different uh, technique that increases resolution, uh, which uh, many of you here are uh, very well aware of. Uh, so uh, there is uh, uh, a strong connection to, uh, to the Exner um, medal because uh, uh, Stefan Hell, uh, who uh, invented this, was, uh, was one of the earlier laureates. And I would like to also point you to the very middle of the audience here. Uh, the, the person who is cited here uh, with Kla et al. is actually sitting here uh, right in front of you as well. Hi, Thomas. <laughs> so, um, the, the way this works is uh, that you overlap uh, an excitation beam with a second laser beam uh, that has two properties. The first one is it has a hole in the middle uh, where it doesn't do anything. And the second one is that it turns off fluorophore. Uh, and turning off the fluorophore is done very similarly as in this laser here with stimulated emission. And with this, you can create a scenario where the region from which you actually read out the signal is much, much smaller than the original excitation spot uh, reaching into the nano uh, scale domain. So we built uh, on another uh, technology here, uh, which, which sounds very simple, but is very powerful by just pouring fluorescent molecules into the extracellular space. It turns out that cells are visualized as negative shadows and uh, when you read this out with, uh, with uh, SED microscopy, uh, you, you realize that you see the individual cellular structures at very high defi uh, definition. This is a technology that was developed by the Negal group in uh, Bordeaux and is called super resolution shadow imaging. However, uh, with uh, the super resolution techniques, th there are very intertwined limitations uh, between the 3D resolution that you can achieve the signal to noise ratio with which you read out uh, your uh, cellular structures and the light exposure you need to put onto the living tissue. And uh, well, if you were just to naively increase resolution and signal to noise ratio, you would automatically also increase light exposure. And I think it doesn't need much biological understanding uh, that these cells here don't look particularly happy. Actually, uh, they're just uh, bursting here if, uh, if, you, if you put on uh, a lot of laser light. So this is why we, we said we need to find ways how to get around uh, these intertwined limitations. And we leveraged uh, optical modifications to stat microscopy uh, in order to uh, reach isotropic, meaning the same resolution in all three spatial dimensions with very high definition on the one hand side. Uh, but then we capitalized on uh, deep learning, like, uh, I mean, you're all very much aware of, uh, of how this is uh, transforming various uh, areas of life, but it, it also really brings about new concepts of, uh, of uh, how to, to approach biological imaging. Uh, we, uh, here we use deep learning to augment the information uh, on the sample, and then we take these two elements together with the same satellite exposure, uh, the same specimen in the one hand case, in the classical case, looks like this. And, and in this uh, lioness case, uh, which is uh, the technology that we developed here, uh, uh, it, um, well, it, it's decoded at much, much higher definition. Uh, lioness stands for life information optimized nanoscopy enabling saturated segmentation. To give you a bit more uh, detail, uh, what we do is that we record uh, imaging volumes at high resolution, but very low signal to noise ratio, meaning very low light exposure, then we use the deep learning to channel in additional information uh, 
which, um, which comes from prior measurements. So the system already knows to a certain degree uh, what brain tissue looks like and the actual measurement is used as a, as a primer then to reconstruct the final um, imaging volume. And then we take another level of deep learning uh, to interpret uh, these complex data and transform them into segmentations, meaning that we are able to draw out uh, the individual cells and their connections. Well, uh, for the first step of deep learning, uh, we take a large number of paired volumes that are recorded, one at high, uh, high signal-to-noise ratio, the other at low signal-to-noise ratio, and then we train the network uh, such that we can get away with recording uh, very low signal-to-noise data in the upper panel, and then uh, use this prior information to transform it into high signal to noise data uh, in the lower panel. With this, we spare about 85% of the photon and uh, we get about seven times faster. Now, when we apply this now to living brain tissue, uh, the architecture uh, of uh, uh, the cellular architecture stands out very clearly. The big white dots here, uh, these are the, the cell bodies. And uh, when we zoom into uh, this region here, you see individual fibers coming in. Uh, these are actually called mossy fibers, and they sign up onto uh, the cells in the hippocampus. And if I have any chance that you remember anything from that talk, it's actually these synapses now uh, that bring in the information into your hippocampus, uh, and then uh, uh, people believe that the, the engrams are formed uh, downstream of these uh, synapses in the hippocampus. Well, when we fly through uh, these um, imaging volumes, one gets the feeling, oh, it should be possible to trace this out. I mean, it, it almost feels that you could, you could paint this. And uh, well, uh, quite frankly, this is exactly what we did. Uh, so we sat down and we uh, started painting each individual cellular structure in these volumes, uh, which is a process called manual segmentation. Uh, and uh, this is a very small volume. It's about 500 cubic microns, and this takes about 500 hours. Uh, so it's very poorly scalable, but in principle it shows that you can trace out uh, these uh, structures. And th that was the point when we then uh, approached our computer science friends uh, both at ISD and at Harvard, and uh, we uh, applied uh, technologies that had been uh, developed in the context of electron microscopy to also make sense of our data. So we delegate this tedious task of hand painting uh, the neuronal structure to a high power computing cluster uh, that can do this uh, well in, in more on the time scale of minutes rather than uh, hours and weeks that a human would take for it. And uh, with this, we can then go back, manually correct individual structures, and, uh, and then, uh, well, pick structures of interest out, uh, like the axons here, uh, which are the wires that, uh, that delay uh, or yeah, relay information in the brain, then the dendrites where this information is collected, uh, and for example, here, fragments of glial cells. So I'll just show you one of these um, dendrites, one of these antennal structures, uh, every one of these processes uh, is the site of one synapse, and then you see how the other neurons uh, come in and uh, provide their uh, information. So this is uh, a short stretch, about 20 microns of uh, a living neuron, uh, and, and even on that very brief stretch, uh, this neuron received uh, input from 29 axons, which make a total of 39 putative uh, synapses. And you can see this here in a, in a bit more zoomed view, how uh, they wrap around each other. Well, I said in the beginning that light microscopy is very good at certain things, and one of these is molecular labeling. So we can overlay these black and white images with uh, information on where synaptic molecules reside. Here in uh, orange, that's excitatory synapses. In, uh, in, um, in blue, the, uh, these are the pre-synapses uh, of, uh, of the neurons that bring the information. And we can incorporate uh, this molecular information into 3D reconstructions. And sometimes we would even 
uh, fine instances where a structure looks as if there was a synapse, but there is simply not the molecular machinery there. Another thing that light microscopy can do very well is to uh, measure the activity of neurons. So with this, we are able to uh, relate the structure uh, of the circuit with the, uh, with the signaling activity that is performed. So probably you have to squint your eyes a bit on this screen, uh, but you see uh, green flashes. Uh, that's when the excitation from, uh, from a different part of the hippocampus comes in here. Uh, one thing that intrigued us very much with these data was that when we imaged the same region again after 20 minutes, uh, we did see structural changes. And so we refined this approach and we combined uh, uh, structural imaging here in black and white uh, with activity imaging and also with stimulation, which you don't see here, uh, and uh, reconstructed uh, the underlying structures. Uh, here in, uh, in, uh, in purple you see uh, just one pre-synapse uh, uh, connecting to a very complex structure uh, on, a, on a neuron. And then we, we reconstructed it on the first day. And since this is living, uh, we could uh, put the sample back into our incubator and uh, image it again on the next day uh, and reconstruct it again, uh, thus revealing how the structure uh, changes over time. This is all very local. Uh, it's, it's small volumes that I showed uh, you here. We can embed them into larger tissue contexts. Uh, but one point that Ed made very nicely is that it's actually very interesting uh, to be able to look across the different spatial scales uh, in brain, uh, from the gross organization of the organ down to the molecular arrangements. And this was the starting point for a different project where we don't deal with life imaging, but we deal, uh, but we uh, develop a similar approach that labels all the cells, uh, but now we do all the imaging in, uh, the, in the fixed state, in the preserved uh, state, uh, which opens up much broader possibilities, for example, than being able to combine it with expansion microscopy. Well, for us, the starting point really was that we said, okay, uh, light microscopy is typically good at visualizing individual cells. Here, that's a, a cell in the cerebellum or individual molecules, but the context here is really lacking. Uh, so we decided uh, that we should uh, find ways how to also here label the extracellular space, uh, but uh, do it in such a way that we can then uh, fix it and uh, keep everything in place and uh, apply various super resolution imaging technologies like expansion, like step microscopy. Uh, and there is various ways how you could do this. And uh, one of them is to exploit the natural boundaries in the living system uh, and make sure that the, uh, that the probes don't penetrate into cells. Uh, or you could also say, well, there's certain classes of molecules that are located anyways outside cells, so why not label those? Uh, and when I go back to, to this image of synapses that I just showed you, when we apply a probe that stays outside the cells uh, and that has a, a reporter moiety, like a, a fluorophore, and a moiety that attaches it to structures indiscriminately, uh, then the same region, when read out with step microscopy, looks like this. So you can uh, see here the cell bodies, you can see these little dots, these are individual axons, and you can see these strange ball-like structures. So when I overlap these two, uh, then you realize that the molecular information falls very nicely in place uh, and tells us that these globular structures, uh, they are actually very complex synapses uh, that uh, uh, are again here located in the hippocampus. So we can uh, reconstruct the individual uh, synapses. Uh, we can even tell, like that's the, that's the part that delivers the information uh, to, uh, to, the, to the next neuron, that's called the bouton. Uh, we can even pinpoint the regions where the information is uh, transferred to the next uh, neuron. Uh, we can see how it's embedded uh, in the tissue context. Uh, and, uh, well, we can make uh, a gallery, since this is very easy with light microscopy, uh, and quantify uh, 
uh, the properties of, uh, of these synapses. So let's go one step uh, further uh, and uh, compare what uh, we would usually see in light microscopy. Uh, these are three cells that are positively labeled and uh, well, you, you would just see those, those cells but nothing else of the tissue. That's a very incomplete representation. Uh, in reality, if we uh, zoom into this rectangular region, uh, it looks like this. So uh, you see how busy the, the tissue actually is. And uh, now when we fly through, uh, you'll see this one positively labeled cell flashing up, and then uh, we can reconstruct this. And from all the neighboring structures, we see uh, what else connects uh, as synapses to this individual neuron. And you see, even on this very short stretch again, uh, there is, uh, if I remember correctly, something like 56 or so uh, structures that do connect uh, to, uh, to this uh, one neuron and provide information to it. Uh, we can turn this around and we can look at uh, what one individual synapse has as partners. Uh, so um, here you see a photon. Uh, the, 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 the long line is, uh, is the axis that brings in the information. Uh, here, that's an excitatory cell uh, that this photon brings information to. In white, you see uh, the contact sites between the neurons. And then here on these philopodia, these tentacles, uh, it's thought that, uh, that these photons connect to inhibitory uh, cells. Uh, so you, you get more of a grasp of the whole uh, circuitry. And, uh, well, uh, this goes on for a little while, uh, but we can look at various brain regions in the meantime, and uh, it's quite fascinating how diverse the brain is. And, uh, well, obviously one would then like to be able to, to image large regions, and this is where we go back to expansion microscopy. Uh, you see here uh, the, uh, the entire hippocampus, uh, like this, uh, region that is very in, uh, important for information storage and, and for spatial navigation uh, expanded uh, with its cellular architecture uh, and we can then, for example, trace out an individual cell uh, in such large-scale data sets. Uh, and, well, uh, much in the spirit of Wilhelm Exner, uh, and I think uh, Ed also showed this very nicely, uh, these these technologies, yes, they are intended to provide uh, fundamental information on the biological uh, systems, uh, but then the, uh, the, the step to apply this, for example, to human disease is not very big. Uh, and I show you just one example here uh, for a demyelinating disease. So that's a bit similar uh, as multiple sclerosis, but it works, uh, it works uh, or, or it has a different mechanism. So in, uh, in yellow, you see where myelin is present in this human brain biopsy, which uh, was collected for diagnostic purposes. Uh, but you also see these black regions where, uh, where the insulation on, uh, on the nerve cells is missing. And when I overlap this uh, with uh, the structural data uh, that I just showed you before, uh, then uh, we can zoom in and we can see, for example, how the regular brain tissue uh, is displaced from the blood vessels and I go over here. So it's displaced from the blood vessels uh, with uh, a lot of inflammatory cells and the normal brain tissue starts here, but it's actually not normal, but it's, it's uh, full of bubbles and edema due to, due to the inflammation. Uh, well, and with this, I would uh, like to close by um, acknowledging uh, very generous funding that uh, that is very important to drive science uh, forward. And then, uh, as the most important slide, I would like to acknowledge everyone who has uh, contributed to this work. Uh, so this is uh, the, the group going on a, on a hike somewhere south of Vienna. Uh, these are the current group members, the former group members. In bold, uh, those people have, uh, from which I've shown data. And then there's a large uh, pool of collaborators in the various disciplines uh, without whom also uh, uh, this type of research would not be possible. So thanks a lot.